You know, we sang a song earlier, moment by moment. Yes, Lord. We're kept by his love, his mercy, his grace. Amen. And it's the Holy Spirit who keeps us. The Holy Spirit who guides us. Right. The Holy Spirit who empowers us. Right. Everything is through the Holy Spirit of power. Nothing is of this world and nothing is of ourselves. It's all from God and we're blessed by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives because he walks with us daily. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we come before you this morning thanking and praising you for this blessed day that we can come from the world, forget the things of the world, and just focus on you. What a blessing it is to be in your presence. Here with, with other believers who love you with all their heart, with all their mind, with all their being. May your spirit be with us mightily today. May you move among us freely. And may we enjoy your presence in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Last Sabbath, the last two Sabbaths, we were uh, live streaming. And last Sabbath brought an end or conclusion to the week-long virtual Arizona camp meeting. And all who chose to attend, whether they were in person or like us, came to church and we had the large screen up and it was streamed into us. We saw the speaker live, but he wasn't here in person. And we were all mightily blessed by all that we heard. Both Sabbath sermons were, were tremendous. And, and if you watch any of the programming, other than the Sabbath morning services, they were richly blessed. Amazing. I, I've always loved camp meeting, concerned about what would happen this year, but, uh, but the message is, and all that happened was uh, with a blessing to everybody who saw it. Each speaker that spoke throughout the week and each Sabbath had a, presented a unique message, all vital to the time in which we now live today. And as we listened, we found ourselves individually challenged to prepare for those things which lie ahead, those things which we believe are soon to come upon the world, upon this earth. We know prophecy. We've studied prophecy for years. Do we have it all right? Probably not. But we have, as one pastor said, the truthiest truth in town. Our, our understanding is biblically based, inspired by God. We have Ellen White as a, as a prophet who gives us guidance and understanding, and yet having said all that, we still don't know all the details, don't know how it's all going to play out. But it will play out. God will have the last word. And he is here to make sure it plays out the way he has determined to play out, and he will be here to bless his people. All the messages that were delivered this past week were messages that we, as a people of God, needed to hear. We live in the very throes of eternity. And, and we see things happening around us that are amazing to us. From the vision given to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar saw the, the, the large image, this statue of the four kingdoms, and then the ten toes uh, that were of iron and clay. We know that was Rome. Uh, we know that pagan Rome collapsed under the, uh, the savage hordes that invaded Rome and just pillaged them and destroyed them. And, and uh, we live in the days of those ten toes, those ten kingdoms that uh, are in the world today. Four great kingdoms, that's all there was. They're gone. And when, when that last kingdom divided, it didn't go away, it didn't disappear. It 
broke down to ten kingdoms that could be representative, the to- final number of God or the perfect number of God, or it could refer to a literal ten kingdoms of, of this world. But nonetheless, in that Daniel's uh, rendition of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, we learn that the next great event is the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the next thing that will happen that any significance in this world. Much will happen between now and then. Much in the way of trial and tribulation will come our way. We know that. But the next great event is the coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. And I can hear an amen for that. Praise and glory be to our God. Jesus is that stone that was cut out without hands, which struck that image at its feet, because that's the time in which we live. We live in the end of time, the church of Laodicea. And this church, which encompasses every denomination, struggled on every level. And that's the church in which we live today. And that stone that's cut without hands, at the reference to Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. When he hits this world, he grinds it into powder and it blows away as chaff. And the kingdom of God takes and becomes the kingdom of this world. God will reign in this world. There will be righteousness again in this world. But Jesus' second coming is the last or the next great event that we look forward to in this world. And the question is, are we ready? There is a crisis on our horizon. On your horizon and on my horizon. It looms larger than life itself. Will we be prepared? Are we prepared? And Prophecy, not prophecy, but the spirit of prophecy tells us, talked about God's people being ill-prepared. Laodicea, the church of Laodicea, in which we live, it reads, they think, the church thinks, believe it is rich and in need of nothing. That's us. But knows not that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We're struggling on every level and We don't understand our struggles. We don't understand what we're dealing with. And we're coming to a a very difficult time in earth history, ill-prepared. And God is calling his people, everyone who has called upon his name, who believes in him, who trusts in him, and all those who do not, to, he's calling us to prepare for the impending conflict. He's calling us to draw nigh unto him. Because he is our anchor. He is our strength. He is our fortress. He is our everything. First Corinthians tells us that Jesus became for us our wisdom. He became our sanctification. He became for us our redemption. Everything that we need in this world of which we have nothing, he is all those things to us. And the only way for us to to receive those is to draw nigh, draw close unto him. Psalms 73, verse 28. Turn there, if you will. Psalm 78 and verse 28. I said 23, I'm sorry, 28. It says, but it is good for me, David speaking, to draw near to God. There are many benefits in drawing near to God. Not just a few, many, many, many. I put my trust in Adonai, Yehovah, that I may declare all your works. God has blessed us beyond measure, and he simply asks us, to praise his name, glorify him, and to tell of his wonderful works, his wonderful testimonies he's done in the past and he's done for each one of us in our lives today. And if we are alive, 
if we are breathing and God is not blessing us, then we have a problem. And the problem is us and our connection to God. He said that I may declare all your works. And from Psalm 9, he said, And for those who know your name, and I pray everyone here knows the name of their God, in your name will they put their trust. They put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you, who draw nigh unto you. We are told we will seek him and find him when we seek him with all our heart. We call out to him night and day in prayer, in supplication, seeking his good and glorious will for us in our lives and in our time of trouble. And the scripture in Hebrews tells us that he, God, is our help in the time of trouble. And we are in a time of trouble. We have been. This world has always been in trouble. But the trouble is increasing. It's growing. And we see it coming. We are fast approaching the time of crisis. And how, how does one prepare for such an event? We can be overwhelmed. It can take us out. How do we prepare for such an event that's coming upon the world? the likes of which the world has never seen before nor will ever see again. And this morning, we will look to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one who came, who God sent into the world to bear our sins in his body and tree because of the great love for us. And he faced an onslaught of persecution and trial and everything else that came with it, and eventually the cross. How did he prepare in a time of crisis? And we want to look at that. And if you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. How did our Lord and our Savior prepare for a thing that came to him in his life, in his crisis? And we know from Scripture and other places, that, that what we read about the end of, of, uh, the end of his crisis and led up to the cross of Calvary and his death on the cross was not the only crisis he faced in his ministry. He faced many crises. Matthew 26, verse 30. They're in the upper room. They just finished the Last Supper. And they're walking from that upper room down, winding back down through to the Garden of Eden. It was quite a walk. And there are many chapters that we read that were from that that journey down to the Garden of Gethsemane. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be offended by me this day. The New American Standard reads, and the King James, New King James reads, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. Tells them trouble is ahead and you need to prepare. As his word and his prophet has told us, we ought to prepare as well for the time that are coming upon us so we are fallen prepared and not ill prepared. And he quotes Isaiah, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And from history, from the scripture, we know that they were scattered. That's only the beginning of the story. Verse 32 said, but after they, had, after they had been raised, no, I lost my place here. 32, yes, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter answered and said to him, even if all, all these are made to stumble, made to be offended because of you, I will never 
be made to stumble. Pretty bold statement. I wonder how many of us have made statements of the like. I worked with a gentleman who would make statements like that. When the time of trouble comes, not a problem, I'll be ready to suffer. I will take whatever comes without any hesitation. And I pray for him often because I don't know where he stands. I know he loves the Lord, but until things happen, we don't know where we are. Are we right with the Lord? Do we have the Spirit filling us? Are we walking in Him, in the light that He's given us? Are we faithful? Are we true? Questions that we need to ponder and answer to examine ourselves. Because our spiritual life itself rests on the answer. If we're not ready, we are told to get ready, to prepare. And Peter speaks boldly, I will never be offended, never to me be made to stumble. Then Jesus answers and said to him, Assuredly I say to you that this night, before the cock or rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You think with that, Peter would be a little bit more reserved in his statements, but he goes on, and Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you this night, I will not deny you. And then these last few words. And so said all the disciples. Jesus is the spokesman. I mean, Paul, Peter is the spokesman here. He's the one who's out front making these large claims. But the others are there with him saying the same thing. All the disciples said the same thing. They would not stumble because of him. They would not be offended because of him. So they were in conflict with their Lord and Savior that night. They thought themselves solid, prepared to stand in a time of trouble, prepared to take whatever came their way. But they were struggling in the relationship and their walk with God. And as we know from Scripture, all fled him. All ran from him. When they saw the cohort tie his hands and him willingly giving his hands out to them, they were perplexed beyond belief and they all fled. They all left him. And like the disciples of old, we too are singly unprepared for his coming for us. We have no idea what lies ahead. And there's only one place of safety for any of us. And that's in the shelter of his presence and of his word. His word is truth. His word is a lamp onto our feet. He is our God. We have his promise he will protect us. He will keep us. He will guard us. He will sustain us. He will take care of all things for us. We need not worry about anything, but there is a condition. We must come to know him. We must put our trust in him, not just words, not just the mouth speaking. It must be followed by action. And I remember one time years ago when I was a young man, and that wasn't yesterday, I worked at a place as a, as a crew chief in the steel yard. And I had taken some battery tests. And because I passed my test, I got stuck welding on this truss for a civic center that was 211 feet long and 20, 21 foot high, beams weighed 100 pounds a foot. Some big stuff. I was blessed to work on that. And it was a blessing. One day, my dad, my father worked there. He was the head of maintenance at the plant. And we had a, the North 40, we called it, out in the back of the yard. Huge area had pre, uh, stra uh, pre concrete prefabbed. 
It had forms on there where they made uh, trusses for things years earlier. And all these contra uh, concrete pads were out there. You know, the entire field was covered with them. They were spaced. And uh, uh, we worked on those because they're still placed embedded in the concrete. We could weld to them. We could attach to them. And uh, we had a couple machineries, a piece of machinery called heisters. A uh, tractor with a boom on it. And it picked up some pretty heavy loads. We were using those because these beams were heavy. And we're trying to move about uh, 200 feet of beam, 100 pounds a foot, with this machine. And uh, we had a new heister, an old heister, and we had the old heister. And uh, it had stuck. Well, it would get stuck, I should say. They had a, a lever by which you control the, the wench, and we had inch and a, inch and a half cable. So it was heavy, heavy duty cable. And uh, when you pull the lever, it, would, uh, it engaged the wench, and when you let go, it wouldn't always release. And that cable would continue to pull and stretch. And uh, the gentleman who was in charge of the job made a comment to my father. And my father could be rather uh, forward and, and uh, say things very, very, very blatantly. And the foreman had just come out. His name was John. And uh, he uh, was talking about the job and asked about this and about these things. And we talked to him. And, and Fred said, we have a problem with the heister. And uh, he said, oh, you do? He looked at my father. He said, is there a problem? And... My father said yes, and he started to tell, relate to John all the things that he needed to do with his heister, and that every time he puts this order in, they cut this, and they take this off, he said, bottom line, I can't do the work because you keep cutting the work orders. And John was not going to allow this to continue, so he stepped in, and he started cutting my father like I've never seen anybody cut before. I mean, he just kept going really at him again and again and again. And he was wrong. And I'm standing there. In fact, I'm on the heister, operating the heister at that time. And I wanted to raise my hand to say, I felt like a school kid, I wanted to raise my hand to say something. And I tell you what, that arm was so heavy, there was no picking that hand up. I was struggling, and I listened to this guy go on and on and on, relentlessly go on, railing against my father. And finally, and I don't know what, the, what it was, but I got the strength, and I think I raised my hand, and I shouted out at John. And John and I didn't have the best relationship. I was much like him, very confrontational in those days, and I didn't take any guff off of him. And, but that day I was, I was struggling. And I said, John, my father's right. This thing, with the pressure we're putting on this wench, could kill somebody if that cable tears. And it's frayed. He looked at me and he said, all right, do it your way. But if it is not the problem, you will answer to me. Speaking to my father. I've been, and I think all of us have been, in situations where, where we want to jump in to help somebody or say something, but the doing is not quite as easy as, as the thinking. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I believe that's part of our problem that stems from, from sin in this world. Jesus had spoken to all disciples many things which must come to pass. He talked them, taught them again and again and again. And on occasion they seemed disinterested and seemed not to understand and continued to walk in the knowledge they had and what they believed was the right way. Kind of like us at times. 
what they believed to be God's plan for their life and for what was happening around them. Jesus spoke to them at least three times on three occasions regarding his being handed over to the Gentiles, his scourging, his death, and his resurrection. And scripture records in Luke 18, but they understood none of these things. And my thought is, how can Jesus say something so plain and they not understand? And yet, when you look at the preconceived ideas that we have as believers, one can understand. As you work with people who have understandings different than ours, you can talk and talk and talk to them, show them scripture after scripture, and they don't get it. Because the Holy Spirit has to be the one who touches their heart and their mind. We can't change anybody. The Holy Spirit has to do the work. And so they did not understand any of these things that Jesus told them about what was coming. And at least on three occasions in Scripture, he talked talk to them very plainly. And I would suggest that in our, in our day, today, we find ourselves in much the same problem. We look around our world today, and some don't see it this way. Many others do. We witness, have witnessed the rise of what looks to be the one world power in this, in this coming world, this coming kingdom. We see people choosing sides, you know, and it looks to be God or man, because on man's side, everything looks to be traditions, cultures, the things of mankind, not the things of God. We see the one world government coming into place, into position. We see the proliferation of Sunday, uh, the Sunday laws on a worldwide scale, not before seen. We see the development of implementation of technology to control the buying and selling. And the technology is already here, and governments in Europe have already implemented it, and our, our government is talking about implementing it today. And the reality is they can go to your bank account because it's all electronic these days and shut your bank account off, and you have nothing to buy or sell with. And we look at the world and we see the governments of the world working to a single objective, control of the masses of people. Right. When I look at these things, it's obvious to me what is happening. I can see the handwriting on the wall. Do I know how it will all end? No. I mean, yes, I do. How the details work out, I do not know. And it's interesting we look at, at the, the issue of uh, the Sabbath uh, and, and uh, Sunday laws. I remember reading back 30, 40 years ago, and I remember studying this message. And not so many years ago, listening to, to uh, podcasts and, and reading and studying the scriptures and, and studies uh, about this from Adventist perspective. And nobody saw COVID-19 coming. Nobody saw the governments imp implementing what we have seen in the last year and a half. Nobody saw this coming. We see issues in this world happening and bringing about circumstances we weren't prepared to deal with. And it's like we were looking for the enemy come from one direction, and yet everything coming from a different direction, being blindsided. And I wonder if we, like the disciples of old, could too have some things wrong that would cause us not to see clearly what God is doing and how he's working things out and unprepared for the crisis that lies ahead. And there's only one safeguard. And it's not our wisdom, it's not our knowledge, it's not our insight that we can trust or depend on. We 
can do nothing. We have no strength, no power, and our wisdom is the wisdom of men. Unless, of course, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and He's the one leading and guiding. Peter, along with the other disciples, were full of bravado, filled with self-confidence. It's obvious as you read that scripture. And verse 31 reminds us all would be offended. All would be made to stumble when they took Jesus. All fled. They left him alone. He was alone. They said, I'm not alone. God the Father is with me. And he's with us as well. And yet Peter had said not long before, I will never be made to stumble. And so said all the disciples. These things are written for our admonition, for our teaching, upon whom the ends of the world has fallen. That's us. God is calling us to wake up, to smell the roses, to come into harmony with him, to draw near to him so that he can draw near unto us. If we draw away from God, he'll draw away from us, Scripture tells us. We need to draw close nigh unto him. Because we stand on the verge of the final events of earth's history. And I pray that we are not destined to repeat the mistakes made by the disciples. But the question is, how can we keep from making the same mistakes they made at the time of their visitation? At Jesus' first coming. How can we keep that from happening? But God does give us the answer. As we continue reading, from verse 36 on, we'll find that answer. In verse 36, they're in the garden, and they're praying. I'll start with 36 and read on. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. A guard he was prayed at many times. He said to his disciples, sit here, and I will pray over there. He was telling the nine, or at this point the eight who were there, the eight, stay here, okay, and, and I, while well, I go over there, I pray. And then he took with him the inner circle of three, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed, very much uncharacteristic of our Lord and Savior. He was always in control. He stood tall. He stood firm. He didn't bow the word of God. He didn't compromise. He stood firm for he knew it was right. And tonight he was different. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. He knew what lay ahead of him. He knew what was coming. And his humanity shrunk back from the reality that was coming upon him mightily. Even to death, he says. He's struggling. Then he says to the inner three, stay here and watch with me. Watch with me, Jesus says. And that means not to fall asleep. Why? Why did Jesus want his disciples to stay awake with him? It was for a purpose. He's struggling. He's not in control like he had been before. Something has him upset, and he's going to the source to try to work things out, and he asked for his disciples to be there with him in his time of trouble. Like any of us, if we're struggling, things are falling apart, and a friend comes to our side, to our aid, we are blessed immeasurably. And that's what Jesus was looking for. But found very little of that. 
Praise God for the Father who was with him. He wanted his disciples at his side for a purpose. Verse 39 says he went on a little farther and fell on his face and prayed. And Jesus prayed. Wow. Powerful, powerful words. Jesus prayed, saying, O oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And there we see the conflict of which Jesus is dealing with. But the key here, he went a little bit farther and fell on his face before his God, before his, the creator of this world, of which he was part, the, the Ancient of Days, and he says he prayed, fell to his face, prostrated before God, and prayed to his loving Father. Beautiful, beautiful words. And in verse 40, Jesus came to the disciples after he prayed and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, you might wonder why Peter? Why do you single Peter out here? Because Peter was the one who would go a step beyond everyone else. All would flee. All would run. But Peter would have a second run at it. He, goes, go, he followed them in at a distance, it says. And uh, rather than taking a stand as John did and letting them know who he was and why he was there, he became one of the guys fell in along the fire, just trying to blend in and be one of the folks, not be known as a Nazarene or a Galilean, I should say. He tried to fit in. John stood. Peter fell. We need to be true to our God. Scripture tells us, Roman or Isaiah 6 tells us, if we take a stand, God will keep us standing. John took a stand. They knew who he was to be a disciple of Jesus. Peter didn't do that. John stood and Peter didn't. And in verse 41, Jesus gives us the ultimate key to victory in every situation, for every age. Right. He says, watch and Pray, watch, stand at my side. Confess me as Lord and God. And pray, pray without ceasing. Pray like you've never prayed before. And Jesus knew what was coming upon the disciples and upon Peter. He knew that this night their life would end as they knew it. And it did. Because Two days, three days later, where were they at? In the upper room, the Bible says, locked away for fear of the Jews. They got the leader, and now they're coming for us. John took a stand, and he stood. Peter didn't take a stand for right, and he didn't stand. Watch and pray. And you know, when it comes right down to it, that's all any of us can do. How much control do we have in this world? We do believe if we're in control, things will be better. Whether our host, household or the president or world leaders. If we're in charge, things will be much better. Watch and pray. We know not what's coming, what stand before us, what intimidation we will receive, and that seems to be the thing that gets most of us most readily, intimidation, being singled out. And we see that happening even today. If you have a shot, great, if you don't have a shot, and don't want uh, these foreign objects in your body, they're the problem. We see the division happening even today. Right. And it's an individual decision, but we see it happening happen on a global level.
through prayer. Jesus communed with his Father continuously, almost without interruption. And he was imbued with the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray for the Holy Spirit, we pray for the latter rain, and we ought to. But the reality is, we need to have the infilling of the Holy Spirit to prepare us for the latter rain. Because God will not pour his spirit out upon half-baked Christians. And at best, we are all half-baked Christians. We talk about commitment. When we are committed, who controls that commitment? We do. I choose how committed I am. I choose when I want not to be committed. It's up to us. I'm in control. And we like that. I heard a couple times this morning the word surrender used. That's really a biblical term. Because surrender, we give it all to God. If we're going to choose God, there's only one choice for us to do things His way. By His power, by His Spirit. But as committed Christians, like to do things our way, and we'll stay committed as long as it benefits us. Jesus spent constant hours in prayer with his Father. He knew his Father well. He knew his voice well. And because of his relationship with his Father, he was imbued with the Holy Spirit, as we can be, as we are to be, because Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit to be with us how long? Always. Never to leave us, never to forsake us. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. That's what we need. We need to be in prayer for that spirit, for that power, to work transformation in our lives, to free us from the bondage we may be under, and comfortably so, maybe. There's bondage in this world that we may submit to, but it's still bondage. I was praying this week. Listened to Goya last week. Last weekend, powerful sermons. I've heard them before, but powerful sermons. And I said, Lord, I'm in bondage to things in this world. I am. All of us are. And I ask you to come into my life to work a work I cannot do, and to free me from the bondage. The, my Bible says that Jesus came to set the captives free. And praise be to God. He's, been here, he's heard my prayer this week, and he's freed me from some of these bondages. Still have a way to go. But he is true to his word. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. How do we know God's with us? The Holy Spirit is with us. He is God. He fills us. He renews us. He refreshes us. And it comes through prayer Continual and constant prayer. Paul tells us, admonishes us to pray continuously. Pray without ceasing. Pray with persevering. Pray, pray, pray. And God's church, we as God's people, need prayer desperately. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us in prayer. You've been in a situation where, you, where you're praying and you're stumbling because you don't know what to pray. I've been there and asking the Spirit to come in and guide my prayers. And the Bible says he will do that. We need the Holy Spirit. We need him in our lives today. He's evidence that God is with us. And because he's with us, we'll do mighty things. And Jesus says greater things 
than I have done, you will do. We need the Holy Spirit. He comes through prayer by invitation. The enemy comes in like a storm. He doesn't ask. He comes uninvited, but he comes. And he forces his way in. Doesn't care how he gets in. He wants in and he wants control. But the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, they stand at the door and they knock. And Jesus Give us great admonition. If you hear me knocking, open the door and I will come in. And I'll bring the food and we will eat together. Because he is the bread of life. We need the Holy Spirit. We need that power to live out each day of our lives to prepare us for what is coming. Each trial, every day, and for the ultimate filling of the Holy Spirit in power upon the world, we need that Holy Spirit. How did Jesus prepare for this crisis? We saw him in the garden praying. The same way he prepared for every other event in his ministry. In Luke 31, Jesus prayed after his baptism by John the Baptist, but Jesus prayed, thanking his God and his Father. In Mark 1.35, it says it tells he prayed early in the morning prior to the start of his busy day, and it was a very busy day. In Luke 6, he prayed all night long. The entire night was spent in prayer before he called his 12 disciples the next day. He had a group of disciples, we don't know how many, but much more than 12, at one point over 500. And many walked away in John chapter 6 because Jesus said, you know, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? And they walked. They walked. Jesus prayed alone with his disciples, as he should have, Luke chapter 9. I wonder how much time we spend in prayer. I was reading about Spurgeon, the great, the great preacher. Wasn't that Adventist, but nonetheless a great preacher. Marvelous works. And it was his custom, his reality, he would be talking to somebody and just going to prayer. Prayer was so natural to him that it oozed out of him like honey from a honeycomb. It just happened. That's what his life of prayer was all about. It became a natural, spontaneous thing for him to do. And he prayed. And I wonder how many of us pray for our family, for loved ones, for people at work. We ought to be known as people of prayer because we are today in God's house of prayer it shall be called in Luke chapter 9 Jesus prayed before he fed the 5,000 did that great miracle he prayed after a mountaintop experience he prayed went to the mountain alone he had sent the, pe- the disciple away in a boat he sent the people back into the city the towns and he went to the mountain and he prayed all night long. Doesn't say anything about sleep or rest. He prayed. But God says, I will give you rest. I will rest you. It's not a thing where we come to finally receive it. It's a continuing continuance. Receiving God's rest and his peace. He prayed all night long till the fourth watch. And then he walked on the water. And then he quieted the storm because he was one with his Father. A total peace with his Father. And the power of the Holy Spirit was upon him mightily. He's able to do all things he desired. At the tomb of Lazarus, he prayed aloud for those around him to hear before he raised and called Lazarus from the grave, he prayed. 
And Jesus prayed all these prayers, the Son of God. How much more ought we to pray? How much more do we need to pray? He was holy, righteous, without sin. And we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. How much more do we need to pray? But he prayed before he raved Lazarus from the grave. And as Jesus was en route, walking down to the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed for his disciples and all who would believe through the words that they wrote, that's you and I, he prayed for them in John 17. Jesus' life was peppered continuously with prayer, continually praying, always talking to his Father, never consumed with the things of this world. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed. The life of Jesus was one of continual prayer, as should be ours. Amen. And Scripture reminds us that we have not because we ask not. Scripture says, ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Ask. Ask, ask. You want the Holy Spirit? You've got it. Ask. You need strength to overcome a bondage or a sin in your life? Ask. It'll be given to you. Nothing good will God withhold from his people. Nothing, nothing, nothing. He said, ask, and it shall be given. Luke eleven thirty, Luke eleven thirteen. Read if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. All of us do. How much more will your heavenly Father, our loving God, give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You have not because you ask not. We have not, because we ask not. This morning, Martiel had a group of people here praying for the Holy Spirit. I invite all of you to be here Sunday morning, 8 o'clock. I'm sorry, what did I say? Oh, okay. Get my days right. Every Sabbath at 8 a.m. Could be here in the sanctuary. It's early. I know I didn't make it this morning. To pray for the Holy Spirit. Every one of us need desperately the Holy Spirit. We need Him in our walk in this world of sin because we can do nothing. He can do all things. And these temples were made for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. So it's fitting that we come together and pray and ask God to fill each one of us and to draw us ever closer to Him and give us power to overcome those things in our life that we now lack and can't deal with. Pray. Goya, who spoke last Sabbath, said that was a key, prayer was a key to his success in his church. Been dead for years and years and years. His members wouldn't even talk to him. But he prayed. Start meeting with them. And change came about that church. We need God's power to change our lives, to prepare us to talk to the world and tell them that there's a Savior out there who loves them. They don't have to live the way of the world. They can live God's way and be blessed mightily. And if you're walking with God every day, if you fill the Spirit, you have testimony after testimony after testimony to share with all those that you meet every moment of every day. So I invite you all who can make it, 8 o'clock, Sabbath morning, praying 
for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for each individual, individually, and for our church members and for our church, all God's people. And the Holy Spirit is the only means of our preparation in this world of sin, the only means we have available to us. Every trial that comes our way, every tribulation that we will face, including a time of trouble, He is our preparation. He is our rock, our salvation, and it's Him in us that will make these things happen and prepare us to stand in these last days. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And that includes the Holy Spirit of promise. Every provision for our victory has already been made and secured. Scripture says to ask. And my plea to you this morning, will you go to God? Will you ask Him to come in? Will you ask Him to bring change into your life? Because none of us are living lives that bring glory to God or bring the glory to God that we ought to be. Wherever we are in life, wherever our walk with God is, tomorrow that can be a deeper, richer, more fuller surrender and bring more glory to God. Doesn't matter how much you love God, today, by His grace, you can love Him more tomorrow than today. And more the day after than tomorrow. God had an endless, exhaustless amount of provision for us and we live like spiritual paupers in many ways, many respects. God calls us to these things. He calls us to prayer. He wants His Holy Spirit in us to lead us and to guide us in this world of sin to work our way through these landmines, through the chasm that we face, the valleys. He wants to lead us and guide us. He said, if you ask, I will come in with the Spirit and with power. And that's the only way the Spirit comes. The only way it comes is with power. Right. So I invite each one of you today to please, please, please spend time with God in prayer right. and invite Him in. Ask for that Spirit that we need desperately. Right. Because He is life. Without Him and His connection to life, we are nothing and we'll dry up and blow away like the dust of the ground. Right. And remember Sabbath morning at 8 o'clock. Down here by the organ, in front, meeting for prayer. And we appreciate anyone who is interested to come and pray. Bow your heads with me. Gracious Father, we are in great need of your mercy and your grace and your blessings. And we call upon you, Father, to open our hearts and our minds to your word, to look at the words that you have given us and the admonition we have from you. And put in our hearts your Holy Spirit and bring change and transformation to us who desperately need that, and all of us do. None of us is exempt. For a time of trouble is coming, such as we have never seen before in this world. And our hearts need to be prepared for that time of trouble and prepared for your outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. We need you to prepare us because we are not able to do anything of ourselves. And so we come to you, Father, and ask you to be gracious and merciful to us, to pour out your Spirit upon us mightily, that you would cause us to ask that we may receive, without measure, your Spirit, and that he might work mightily in us, and through us, and in the world, and in the church, to bring many who do not know you to a saving knowledge of the truth and be a blessing to those who do walk with you and are struggling in this world of sin. We thank you, Father, and praise you. 
and lift up our great need before you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and know you've already prepared provision for us to receive what you have for us, your spirit, but we need a desire to ask, to receive, and to live according to the grace that you so abundantly bestowed upon us as a church denomination and in our world, Father, you've blessed this world mightily. You've blessed this country. And I pray for your continued blessings upon each one. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen.